Okay, welcome everyone. Today is, I think, a first. I have a room full of non-Sri Lankans. Um, quite excited to be in, in Winnipeg, actually. As excited as... I mean, don't I look excited? As excited as a Buddhist monk can get. Um, because I'm meeting all sorts of... of uh, interesting, not only interesting, but interested people, which is kind of a rarity. There have been other places where it was hard to find people who were like-minded, but uh, it's nice to see so many people interested in the Buddhist teaching and, and, and in good things in general. So thank you all for coming. This, um, this evening program is a little bit... Um, I don't know what the way it was, in, internal. So we're, n we, we're not really expecting people. So you can see that a lot of it is quite traditional and maybe even, well, it's, it's a little religious if you hadn't noticed, um, which may be a little bit awkward for some people or, or not what you expected, but I want to explain that it's a little bit, this is an internal um, affair. So... It's for those of us who have dedicated our lives to this. And, and so we, we seem to be worshipping the Buddha like he's a god, but it's actually just because he's our teacher and because in, in uh, Buddhist and, and Asian circles you do kind of revere your teacher and, uh, for as long as you're studying under him or her. And so because we take the Buddha as our teacher, we do uh, dedicate ourselves to him. And you're, you're, you know, as visitors, you of course don't have to do that. There's no... We're not trying to trick you into joining our cult or something. You're welcome to visit. So if you can bear with us, we certainly don't have any problem with, with visitors. And you're welcome to participate in part or none or all of, of what we do. Um, and as for the Dhamma talk, I don't always have something planned to talk about. So um, it's, it's uh, because I have to give it every day, It's sometimes I just make something up on the spot. But tonight I did kind of think of something anyway to say. Made, had some preparations. As I saw a bunch of Westerners walking in the door, I thought of something to say. So I'm well prepared. Five minutes before we started, I thought of what to say. Um, yeah, I don't... I'm, I was thinking maybe, first of all, it had been interesting to go over some of the the first things that we say, which I've never really talked about. We're, um, I just briefly, this, I'm not gonna, this isn't going to be the, the core of my talk, but just so people know what, what the heck we were doing. We offer things to the Buddha. Um, it's not really something that I'm big into. I don't, I'm not into offering food to the Buddha, for example. I don't look down on people who do it, but it's not something that is much interest to me because it seems kind of silly. He's not going to eat it. And it doesn't look good in front of the Buddha. It seems kind of out of place to me. But uh, offering flowers, candles, and incense to the Buddha is kind of cool because he kind of can use it. You know, it, it, it props up the image of the Buddha. It makes people appreciate, you know, see something um, that is... We don't want to say attractive, although it is attractive, and that's a danger. But uh, something valuable, something that we we as ordinary people who have defilements and like to look at beautiful flowers, something that we value. And uh, beauty, so so in our minds, this is something valuable, as as um, ordinary human beings. And so we, we offer the flowers to the Buddha, but we, we offer it with a, a symbolic gesture. This is um, you know, out of the idea that this is something valuable and it's something uh, something worth offering to people who are worth offering to do and to. And so we offer it to the Buddha, who we feel is worthy of offerings. We offer candles, we offer incense for the same sorts of reasons. Now, of course, they, we've come up with all sorts of symbol, symbolism, but 
it doesn't really apply here anyway. But the light is something. So we, this, a lot of our chanting here, if you read through the English, it's quite maybe quite interesting for some people to learn about. I don't know. The English is always you always lose something in translation, but you get the gist of what's going on. So we 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 talk about our offerings. We say we're offering this. Please accept it. So and why we offer it? We offer light because the Buddha is the one who um, brought light to the world. We offer incense because the Buddha was uh, fragrant in the sense that he was scented or sensed by the world. When, when people saw him, you could sense the goodness about him. The Buddha said this is a kind of a scent. Ananda came to ask the Buddha, what, what, I don't know, it's strange why he asked this, but um, maybe he was trying to give the Buddha an opportunity to, to teach because he said there are many scents that that go with the wind, but is there any scent that goes against the wind? And the Buddha said that one who is uh, virtuous is uh, is scented even against the wind. It means people can tell when someone is virtuous. And the flowers we offer as a, a respect or a, a appreciation of the beauty of the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching. We also pay respect, right? This is something I wanted to talk about. People maybe don't know what this is, these uh, seven things. So we pay respect to all jaitya. See, now, now this, is, this, is, this is, for for those of us who have gotten really into this thing, it's, it's um, something quite interesting because I've been to these places. And uh, so it means something to, to us, you know, talking about Lumbini. Um, in India there are several jaitya. Jaitya means... Uh, a landmark or a, a pagoda, they call them. And there are pla the place where the Buddha was born, the place where the Buddha first, where the Buddha became enlightened, the place where the Buddha first taught, and the place where the Buddha passed away. If you've never been to these places, I certainly recommend going once in your life. It's a, the Buddha even recommended going to these places once in your life. It's a uh, profound experience. It really is. You, know, you, you kind of think, well, He's just saying that, but no, really, when you go to these places, you can feel the, the, the awesomeness of it. So, thinking about this, we, we actually do these chants under the Bodhi tree. I've done these chants under the place, at the place where the Buddha became enlightened. Where you, anyway, I don't know. For, it's kind of religious. This is what religious people say. But I'm amazed that I'm finding myself saying these things, because it's lots of fun, really. It's, uh, it brings up some some sense of, well, of joy and, and confidence and encouragement, paying respect to the Bodhi tree, even from this far away. But the seven places, the Buddha is said to have spent 49 days at the, around the Bodhi tree, and so there were seven places. The first one is where he became enlightened. The second one is where he stood and looked at the Bodhi tree. After he became enlightened, he stood up. He spent seven days at the, under the Bodhi tree, and then he stood up, and he turned and he looked at the Bodhi tree. It's something that enlightened people do, I think, I guess. Um, and then he spent seven days in walking meditation. And there's a place you can see where he did his walking meditation, where he's said to have done walking meditation for seven days. Then he spent seven days uh, in a place, in the Ratanagarang, the jeweled chamber, which isn't actually a jeweled chamber, but he said to have contemplated the Abhidhamma there. The fifth place, he stayed at the Anjapala tree. The sixth place at the Muchalinda tree, where there was a snake. This is the one where you see the Buddha covered by the Naga, who protected him from the rain. And Sattama, he stayed at the Rajayatana tree for the seventh week. These are the seven places. That's all. And, you know, there's something in there where we dedicate our lives to the Buddha. Obviously, you don't have to do that if you don't want. Um, but, yeah, we, we really kind of do that because we, 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 we've dedicated ourselves to this path. Some people do this, no? They decide this path is for them, and so they dedicate their lives to it. That's all that means. It's not compulsory by any means. But, no, what I wanted to talk about tonight is the teaching of the Buddha. So every night we try to chant a piece of it, but tonight, especially since we have 
a fairly diverse crowd and people that I don't know, um, to try to give something general about what is it that we mean by Buddhism, what is it that we mean by uh, the Dhamma, the Dharma, what is our Dharma? Because in India there was this word Dharma and it, it came to be known as your code and every teacher had their own Dharma. Um, in Hinduism there were the dharmas of the different uh, cl social classes. So the Brahmins had their dharma, the Kshatriyas had their own dharma, and uh, the uh, Sudras and the, and just the Vesa, Vesa and the Sudras. They had their own dhammas. So it means this is their, their code, their way, the laws that the laws of nature or the laws of God it would have been that ruled their existence. So the Dharma of a Kshatriya was to protect the country and that mean, meant even going to war and killing people which at the time was beginning to be thought of as not a good thing to kill people. So they had this quandary and, and Krishna, Krishna the, their God came and, said, and explained to them that in the Bhagavad Gita that it's the Dharma of the Kshatriya to kill. It's his, 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 it's what God wants him to do, something like that. Now, obviously, that's not Buddhism, but that's Hinduism, part of it. So in Buddhism, we have our Dharma, which came to be internally understood as the teaching of the Buddha, the, the truth that the Buddha found. So in Buddhism, we use the word Dharma and truth interchangeably. The Buddha himself used the word dharma to mean simply truth um, or reality. And this is an interesting point. Um, it's a claim that, that the Buddha made in which we make is that his dharma was not just something arbitrarily made up by, by a god or, or arbitrarily not. It wasn't something passed down by anything. It was actually reality. The Buddhist teaching was not a based on views or based on faith or belief. It was based on reality, based on this reality, here and now. Buddhism is very much about finding the here and now, finding reality. This thing that we think we're so familiar with, this thing that we think is is how we live our lives. We think we're in reality. We think we're here and now. And we don't realize how, how much of our lives is spent in illusion, fantasy, caught up in stories and games and plans and worries and remembrances and so on. So the Buddha taught us to, under, to see reality, to come to reality. And, or to understand reality, let's put it that way. This is how this is the Buddha's Dhamma. This is his claim. Of course, I think um, other religions make this claim as well that that their teaching is reality. But they don't emphasize this to the extent that the Buddha did. See, the Buddha didn't say, "Well, but reality is something that isn't obvious." The Buddha never said that. He didn't say like. Reality is you have to believe this or you go to hell or you have to believe this so you can go to heaven and so on. The Buddha said, no, reality is right in front of you. It's what you think you know already. And if you knew it, you wouldn't suffer in any of the ways that you suffer now. So you already know and see what I'm talking about. All, you have, all I'm teaching is to uh, live by it. I mean, we understand things like impermanence. We really do. If you talk to people, they, they know that everything changes, but why do we act like things are, are, are permanent? Or why do we try to make things stable? Science has taught us so much about how impermanent everything is. How, we, how, how you can break things apart into little pieces and see how they're changing all the time, subject to instability. And we don't realize this. We don't. We aren't clear in our minds that this is really the way. We try to. We try to cultivate permanence, stability. We try to cultivate satisfaction, 
getting us all of these things that we know will not make us happy, and yet we gather them and up and collect them. Or we act like crazy people, really, because we know that they're not good. If you ask anyone, well, I know it's not going to make me happy, then why do you crave it? I know that candy's not going to make me happy, but why do I crave it? Why do I want chocolate? I know it's not doing anything for me. I know it's a drug. Why do... Uh, why do we do it? We try to find satisfaction in things that clearly can't make us, can't satisfy us. And we try to control things when... Well, maybe in some cases we really do believe we can control things, but intellectually and logically speaking, it, it's clear that we can't. We, we, we can build up sand castles and live in them, and we can convince ourselves that as long as we keep the sand propped up, it'll stay forever, but we know that at any minute it could fall apart. As, as long as you work to keep yourself uh, in a stable and controllable environment. It's very easy to delude yourself into believing that you can control things. But, you know, does anyone not know the truth of death? Or how many people in this world were like the Buddha, where for 29 years he didn't know that there was such a thing as death? Very rare to find such people who are so sheltered. not being so sheltered, we all understand that we can't escape change. We can't really control reality. And yet, now they're trying to, to make us immortal. There's, a, there's work going on to try to... And they believe. People have actually asked me this question and gotten quite vexed when I, when I th discard it, when I, when I said, ah, I don't believe in such rubbish, that they're going to be eternal that human, be human beings are going to become eternal, or immortal. And yet we know that eternity is, is eternal. You, know, it's not, you can't create a stable, eternal state, because everything is subject to, to change. You, know, you don't know what you're going to do next. If suddenly you decide to kill someone, then you both die. Or you die. You know, someone dies. Death is, death is certain, it's just when is not so certain. So yeah, you can prolong it, you can prolong change, but you can't control, you can't be the master. So for example, in general, these are things that we are familiar with. If we don't really get it, it's not something, something magical or, or out of this world. Everything is in this world. You know, the Buddha taught us to look at the body and the mind. Who doesn't know what that is? The Buddha didn't teach us to, to deal with heaven or magical powers. He didn't focus on these things. Our religious practice, and this is the interest, our religious practice is all about the body and the mind. You see how, how different, that, how unique that is? No, it's not that the body is a temple or the body comes from God. or the. No, it's it's... The body is your religious practice. You are learning about your body. Not for some other reason, to understand your body. You're learning about your mind, not so you can go to heaven, not so that you can do what the Buddha wanted you to do, so you can understand your mind. And honestly, that is what the Buddha taught us to do. There's nothing secret, there's no secret teachings beyond that. So this is, this is the Buddha's meaning of the word Dhamma, or Dharma in Sanskrit. And he went about teaching this for 45 years. He, he, he became enlightened, and I said there's 49 days. After those 49 days, he went traveling around India, spreading this, uh, he, the, the Dharma, the truth that he had realized. The, the realities that he had come to understand. And not only teaching the realities, but teaching a way to realize, a way to understand yourself. Let's put it that way. A way to understand your own experience. And more importantly, a way to overcome suffering. And 
His claim was that by understanding, by simply understanding your experience, you can overcome all suffering. That, I think, in itself is a profound statement and a, a, a bold claim because we have many ideas about what relieves suffering, even in a religious or meditative sense. There are many traditions that say love, love is all you need, right? They say that with love, suffering is vanquished, something like that. The idea in the mind is that once you cultivate love, you will have no suffering or, or you can vanquish all evil. And people believe with its compassion. When you have compassion, if there were compassion in the world, if everyone had compassion, the world would be free from suffering. Um, people, many religious traditions believe faith is all you need. Right? Um, in the Buddha's time, people believed, and, and I think still believe in certain, there are certain religions that believe you, you to be free from suffering, you have to torture yourself, starve yourself to death. The final summation, consummation of religious practice is to starve yourself to death. This is what they say. You go naked and you torture yourself and then finally when you're ready, you starve yourself to death. This is uh, the way of religious practice. And, and the views that people had about what is it that is the cause of suffering and what is it that, it, that leads to the cessation of suffering. So, so the Buddha's claim is not universal and it's not common to all religious traditions. Not even all religious traditions, but it's something we get within Buddhism and it's something that as meditators we should be cautious about. Um, falling into the idea that cultivating this or that is going to be the way, the path to overcome all suffering. Because none of these things are, um, are, are direct enough or are intrinsic enough to, to the problem to, to cure it. It's like if you put a band-aid over the wound, well, you can say that's going to help, but the real question is whether the wound has healed, whether the wound is infected or not. The Band-Aid can be useful in some cases, but it's not the cure for the sickness. Um, so the, the Buddha's claim is that wisdom is the cure for the sickness. The Buddha's famous beginning of his teaching on dependent origination, avijja pajjaya sankara, that ignorance is the beginning of this chain of causation that leads to suffering. So a very important point, and it... it um, can't be stressed enough that it's it's the core of Buddhism is wisdom and ignorance. That ignorance is what causes us to be born again ignorant, just not knowing, not understanding. This isn't it isn't some profound philosophical teaching. We don't understand ourselves. That's why we suffer. Would a wise person do something that was against their best w interests? Would would a person who knew better? do something that caused them suffering. Does anyone want to suffer? I don't know if I can answer that. I don't think anyone wants to suffer, but I, I don't suppose it's impossible to think that someone gets that deluded. But besides the very, very deluded, I think most people, almost all people, don't want to suffer. And yet we cause ourselves suffering. It's unden an undeniable fact that we do things, say things, think things that cause us suffering. Why do we do that? Certainly not out of wisdom. Right? So this is the theory in, in Buddhism, is that we're... Right, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite an obvious truth that um, the reason we're doing these things is because we don't clearly see that they're causing us suffering. We think we do sometimes. I know I'm addicted, I know I should stop. I guess that's the difficulty, that we think we already know, so we think, well, it must be something else. There must be a trick to it. I know already that I'm causing myself suffering. It must be something, I need a pill to take to get rid of it. So it's not quite obvious, it's not an unobvious truth, because we think we know these things. And that's why I said that these are familiar to us. 
a drug addict knows he's in big trouble. She, they don't, you don't have to tell the drug addict that they're addicted. They might try to deny it, but um, even a drug addict who knows they're addicted still finds themselves unable to stop. So we think, well, it must be something else. We, 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 don't, we don't generally key into this, that it's, we would even deny that it's the knowledge that is necessary, because we say, I know I'm addicted. So the Buddha's claim seems a little bit suspect, actually, until you begin to look closer and ask yourself, do you really know this? Will you start to ins examine the addiction, and you realize that you're not—you don't even—you don't have a clue what's going on. You don't have a clue what you're doing. You say, "I know that this is causing me suffering," but the I and the this have nothing to do with reality. The I who knows that this, which is causing me suffering, are not what's really going on. What's going on is there are arising states of body and mind that are working in terms of cause and effect. There arises a instigator, something that is remembered by the mind as bringing pleasure. So you see something. Take the drug addict. You see, um, let's, let's take smoking. You know, a person who is not addicted to cigarettes sees a cigarette and says, wow, that thing's on fire. Stay away from that. But a, a, a person who's addicted to cigarettes looks at it and there arises in the mind the recognition that that is something that has brought me pleasure before even though it's ridiculous that it's, you know, it's something that destroys your body and it tastes terrible and so on, but there arises the recognition in the mind that that brings me pleasure because there's a drug in it. That recognition gives rise to a liking feeling, uh, no, a, a happy feeling in general. That feeling leads to a craving for the, the object, for the, the, the cigarette, and so you pick it up and you smoke it, and then there is the cycle of seeing or, or tasting and so on that leads to pleasure, which leads to liking, and it reaffirms the habit. Um, it goes back and forth, and this is the whole teaching on Paticca Samuppada. Meaning that there is a liking of it, a thought that this brings me pleasure. The mind thinks that's going to bring me pleasure. Whether you say to yourself, I know it hurts me or not, the truth is something very, very different. At the moment when you see the cigarette, you think it's going to bring you pleasure. You really, in, in your heart of hearts, do. And the only, the only thing you need to do to break the addiction is to change that, to when you see the cigarette, to just say seeing. When you feel happy, when you feel pleasure in the expectation of it, say to yourself, feeling, or happy. See it simply for what it is. Break this chain of causation. Instead of saying, that is good, you say, that is that. Right? Seeing, seeing, it's light touching the eye. If you can stop it right there. A, a, a better example that people are easy, easy to pick up on is when someone's talking to you. So suppose someone's yelling at you. That's the best example of this. You, someone's yelling at you, and, and normally it makes you very angry. They call you nasty names and so on. But if you just say to yourself, hearing, 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 and just know it to be a sound, you, you free yourself from any um, sense of, of upset or, or any, um, any potential suffering as a result of it. Because you simply see it for sound, and you're not upset by it. So this this is this is only the surface. No, I'm not even talking about the, the the depth of the Buddha's teaching. But this is the key concept in the Buddha's teaching. When you when you talk about the four noble truths, you're talking about this this process. That okay, there is this suffering, and suffering should be understood. Instead of running away from suffering, we should key into it. Uh, once we understand it, we give up the cause of suffering, which means we stop wanting. We stop craving for the cigarette because we realize, really realize that it's a cause for suffering, and not just a cause for suffering, it's useless. It's, it's not a question of whether it hurts us. It's the point that there's no reason to pick up that cigarette. It's not going to help me in any way. You, you, it doesn't even enter your mind to pick it up. You think, why would I do that? You don't have any desire for it because there's, there's, you know, logically we can we can answer this. We can say there's no reason to pick that up. But because of the craving in our mind, because we still have this ignorance which leads to craving, we pick it up anyway. 
and it becomes very strong in the mind as a habit. So this is this is the idea of what the Buddha taught. But as I said, he not only taught the truth, he also taught a practice by which to realize the truth, um, to, to train ourselves in the truth. So I've alluded to it here, this idea of mindfulness. But if we want to go a little bit deeper as to how mindfulness or this idea of recognizing things as they are, how it, it leads to wisdom, I think this is useful and I want to use it to explain to you, well, first of all, to, to help you reassure you that I'm not just talking from you know, whatever comes into my head. I'm actually taking this from somewhere. So let's, let's go over the Buddha's teaching then. No? The first, first thing that we have to understand is where do we, what is our source for the Buddha's teaching? As I said, the Buddha taught for 45 years. That's a long time. They say Jesus taught for three years, so you have a book about this big, no, the New Testament, it's not very big. And in that, that's the words of Jesus are, are much smaller even. With the Buddha's teaching, over 45 years, he did a lot of teaching. Uh, not only was he around for a long time, but he spent all his time in teaching, giving uh, in-depth um, I don't know what to call them sermons because it's not quite lectures is maybe a better thing. You, m you might want to think of it more like a lecture because he really went into depth about things. And he would repeat things, um, you know, so he would say the same thing to a thou to hundred different, different audiences. Um, meaning he was actually teaching something. He was actually giving course material for people to use. And so he would repeat it in, in, in many different contexts for many different audiences. And we collect, collect all of this. It, this was collected from the time of the Buddha. It was memorized and written down eventually, and it's been passed on. And we now have it as a whole bookshelf, 45 volumes in the Thai edition. That, that's, that's significant. The, I like saying that other editions have different numbers, but it works in Thailand because then you got, uh, it's like a yearbook. <laughs> 45 years, 45 books, uh, a book a year, you know, a textbook size per year, 45 of them. And that kind of gives you some frame of reference. And when you look at all of this teaching, it's quite daunting to make head or tail of it. But luckily, they sorted it into three baskets. So we call it the tipitika. Tip means three. Pitika means basket or, yeah, basket, I think. And these three baskets conveniently conform to the outline of the Buddha's teaching, as you find in the Visuddhimagga, for example, uh, and uh, as you find in many teachings of the Buddha, as the Buddha said in the first verse of, or the, the out introductory verse of the Visuddhimagga, Sile Patitaya Narosa Panyo, that, that verse, where a, a man, no, yeah, it uses the word man, but let's say a person, established in, in, in morality, cultivates concentration and wisdom, such a person, ardent and uh, insightful, will succeed in untangling the tangle. It, it was just a verse that the Buddha used in response to a, an angel who came and asked about the tangle, anto jata bahi jata, the inner tangle and the outer tangle. This generation is entangled in a tangle. How do you untangle the tangle? And the Buddha used this. But Buddha Gosa uses it as an example of how uh, important these three things are, morality, concentration, and wisdom. So, tada! This is how we outlined, the, the, how Buddhist teachers in the past outlined the Buddhist teaching. They put it into three baskets. Anything about so morality, they put into one basket. Anything about concentration, they put in another basket. Anything about wisdom, they put in a third basket. It's not quite like that. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, whitewashing, I don't know, I'm simplifying the whole, the whole process because many people throw out the third basket and say, no, the Buddha only taught the first two baskets. And, 
And in fact, there's overlap. They say, no, wisdom is in this basket as well, but it makes for a good story and an easy understanding. So let's not nitpick. Let's say, okay, go with me here. We've got these three baskets, right? Because we have the three trainings, whether we have three baskets or not, we do have the three trainings of the Buddha, morality, concentration, and wisdom. So whether or not you can actually separate the Buddha's teaching out into three baskets in the way that they've done, whether that's appropriate or not, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Because certainly the Buddha's teaching can be separated out into three aspects, which he did in the Visuddhimagga, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Now, I don't want to be too theoretical, so let's, let's, let's see this in a practical way. What leads you through this path of morality, concentration, and wisdom I'm going, I'm going to go out on a limb and say is one thing, and that is mindfulness, okay? Or, or what, we, what we translate as mindfulness. This is the practice that we're teaching, the practice that we're doing. This is why we're teaching it, because it's the one thing that's going to lead you through this path, from morality through to concentration through to wisdom. It's the one thing that you really, really need. There are many other qualities that you need. We're simplifying it, and I'm going, and and we're going to use this. This is our. The Buddha said it's the driver. Concentration is like the car. A car is a very powerful tool, but if it's directed in the wrong way, it goes smashing into someone's uh, mailbox or something. Mindfulness is what keeps the car on the road, what keeps the car directed. The Buddha even said this, in mindfulness, pamukha, in mindfulness is the leader. Uh, no, not pamukha, mind, I can't remember. Mindfulness is that which, which leads you in regards to all dhammas. And why I think I can go out on a limb, let me hear, hear me out here, because they, 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 this question was asked of, of the monks as well. How do you boil the Buddha's teaching down? And some of you have heard me give this uh, this talk before. Oh no, I gave it at the the temple. The Buddha said the essence of his teaching is. No, he didn't say this. The Buddha's last words. Let's start here. We have right before the Buddha passed away. He didn't. He didn't die in in pain or or. Um, What's the word? He wasn't. Uh, he didn't have Alzheimer's, senile. He wasn't. Uh, no, he wasn't in any sort of state of delusion. He wasn't all drugged up. He was very clear in his mind. So, he knew exactly what he was going to use as his last words. And um, I think we're 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 good to say that. And so, therefore, we we would we should take heed in what his last words words were. His last words were, Appamadena Sampadeta. Vaya Dhamma Sankara Appamadena Sampadeta. All Sankaras, all formations, everything that is formed, everything that, that gets made is, of, is subject to change. Appamadena Sampadeta. Uh, strive on with Appamada, with vigilance, or um, strive on religiously. That's what I would like. No one will follow me on that one. Why? Because it's the opposite of negligence. The opposite of negligence is something called religions. It's a word that should have been made but never was. But it's where I understand, I believe, they got the word religion from. The opposite of negligence. But uh, strive on religiously or strive on heedfully, strive on vigilantly. This word apamada as a result, became a very important word for Buddhists. And the Buddha used it as well. He said, um, he, he explained what is apamada and so on. So this is the word that they took to, to, to epitomize the Buddha's teaching. And, and they, in the commentaries they say the whole of the Tipitaka can be boiled down to one word, the, the path to apamada, the path to religions, the path to vigilance or diligence. Now, as to what the Buddha said is is apamada, he he explained that he 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 equated it to mindfulness, to sati, to this idea of 
recognition. Because the only thing that can guard you, surely guard you from falling into suffering, it's not love, it's not compassion, uh, it's not, it's not abneg self-abnegation, it's certainly not sensual pleasure. The only thing that can guarantee you to be free from um, suffering, free from defilement, to have a clear mind, well, is to, have, is to cultivate a clear mind. The only one thing that can keep you objective, can keep you out of trouble, is to have a clear mind, to see things with a clear mind. So, as we experience reality from moment to moment, our minds change at every moment. When we experience something pleasant, we feel happy about it. We, our whole mind changes. We're content. Sometimes when I'm talking, you might feel content. When I start to go on and on, and then you feel pain in the legs or the back or so on. The whole mind changes, you see. Whereas just a second, you're like, oh, I could sit here for hours. Next moment, bam, when is this going to end? Your whole, your whole being changes. This is, this is how one easy way to understand there is no self. When we talk about anatta, it's an easy way to understand that's, that's non-harmful, that's not scary. You know, it doesn't mean that you don't exist. It doesn't mean you don't have an individual entity as apart from someone else. What it means is that you is very changeable, completely changeable. can change from one moment to the next completely. So the, the emotion that was there a moment ago has nothing to do with the emotion that's there now. The state of mind, the state of contentment. It's not that it gradually changed. It can, it can change in a heartbeat. So the, 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 the one way to uh, negate this, this um, or not to negate it, to, yes, to, to neutralize it, is to, to regard it objectively. Regard your experience objectively. You can't change it. You can't change the pain. The things that you like, you can't keep. You'll see that as we're sitting here, as you're listening to me, the, the good parts of my talk you can't keep. You can't stop me from saying something that's ludicrous or crass or dull or meaningless. You can't stop the pain, you can't keep the pleasure, you can't keep it hot or cold as you like. And you can't control your mind, you can't stop your mind from thinking, from wandering. You can try many meditation techniques. Someone told me today, she said the first time she was taught meditation, she said, you just stop thinking. And she said, well, how do I do that? My mind is not, no, no, you, you just stop thinking. But I can't, my mind is thinking. He said, well, you're doing it wrong, something like that. There's many, many teachers try to explain, and this is, of course, how I, this is how I understood meditation when I was young. Before I knew anything about it, I thought, yeah, it's where you stop thinking, right? No. No, it's not where you stop thinking, it's where you stop judging. It's where you stop following where you begin experiencing, stop reacting and start interacting. Think of it like here's it and here's us and we're entangled. We're caught in this tangle that the Buddhist talked about. Once you untangle the tangle, you fall out. Once your mind is, and I, I illustrate it like this because this is really how it feels. You feel you just whoop, slip out and suddenly there's no problem. You can be embroiled in conflict and feel like your life is over, there's no way out. Because there is no way out, you see. If you can't change things, you can't suddenly say, no, I'm suddenly going to win the lottery and be free from debt, or I'm suddenly going to be free from cancer, I'm not going to have this illness anymore. Something's going to work. Wrong, this is the wrong way out. There is no way out. And once you let go of that idea of trying to find a way out, once you untangle yourself from the situation, your mind just slips out and you're like, yeah, I've got cancer. 
it's not me, it's not mine, it's not under my control, it's nothing, it's cancer, it's just a word, cancer. I have pain. You, know, you, you We are able to do this. It's not easy. This is something you might like to call hardcore Buddhism. It's not easy. I, I, could, talk, I could teach many easy things, you know. I could teach you, oh, it's okay, you know. Now we get up and stretch or do qigong exercises, which are nice. There's nothing wrong with them, but uh, I don't teach them. I'm sorry, I don't mean to. I'm going to get in trouble. But, uh, hmm, how do I get out of that one? Well, there's nothing wrong with love. There's nothing wrong with compassion. And, and qigong goes in, in with all of that. Tai chi, all of these things are good. But there's something better. There's nothing wrong with any of that, and I certainly don't believe there is. But it's not hardcore. It's not getting to the core of Buddhism. It's not really what the Buddha um, taught for us. So, you know, all of these things can supplement your practice, and should. Love should supplement your practice. It's a great practice to keep. Compassion is excellent. Even... Um, the opposite, um, seeing the loathsomeness, meditation on loathsomeness, meditation on death, these are also good things. There's lots of good meditations you can use. But they're not core, they're not hardcore. Really um, sticking with pain, uh, it, it, in, it's not an easy thing to do, but eventually you're more and more and more able to let yourself experience the, the things that, that scare you most, the things that uh, upset you the most, until finally they, don't, they no longer upset you, and you're able to experience them. Okay, I'm taking a long time here because I want to get you through this. Uh, connect these two. Mindfulness. This is why mindfulness is so important. But how does it create morality, concentration, and wisdom? I think I've covered the wisdom part, but I want to backtrack and start morality. Because it's hard to understand. People say, how do the five precepts, you know, we have these rules we keep, how do they really uh, connect with wisdom? Right? It's, it's not obvious. It's, it's a little bit clear. You know, well, if you kill people, you're probably not going to have a happy mind and you'll, you'll, you know, difficult to see the truth if you kill people. I think uh, that one is pretty easy to see. Um, and, and if we put it in that perspective, even the one on, on alcohol, not drinking alcohol is easy to understand. People say, what's wrong with drinking alcohol? You're not hurting anyone. Morality in Buddhism has nothing to do with hurting anyone. Interesting, isn't it? Morality in Buddhism is all about you. When you kill someone, you don't hurt them, you hurt yourself. You can't hurt anyone. You can't affect their mind. I can't make you suffer mentally. You have to react to what I do to you. If I call you nasty names, it's up to you whether you want to react to that. Of course, no one, no ordinary person can help but react to it. So it's very, very bad for you to do it to someone, to, to call someone names, knowing that they're going to react. But ultimately speaking, this is the, the hard truth. Um, and so... With with alcohol, it's really it's really the most important precept, perhaps because it's directly related to what we mean by morality. It cease, it it prevents you from seeing anything clearly. You know, when when you get drunk, of course, you drunk people are are the life of the party, and and you always feel much more intelligent than when you drink, right? Everything you say is witty and charming, and all the ladies love you. And you know, so I'm thinking of myself. When you're drunk, you uh, you think you're you think everything you say is wonderful. But it'd be interesting to see myself videotaped when I was drunk. Huh? See what I looked like. You lose your ability to reason, your ability to uh, rationalize, your ability to be mindful. You know, in fact, the Buddha said this very clearly in the precept: Sura Maria Maja Pamada Thana Pamada. It's a this alcohol is is a base for Bamada, the opposite of, of vigilance, negligence. That's the direct opposite of his teaching, of this core aspect of his teaching. 
But there's something more, there's something deeper than the precepts. Morality is not just the precepts. The, the essence of morality is the beginning of our meditation practice, the inception of our um, practice of sati, of recognition. When we stop following, um, when we bring our minds back to the present moment. So here we are, we're all sitting here. But have you noticed the tendency for the mind to wander? Um, and, and it's not just wander because it's going to a different realm. It's not like here or there. It's here and not here, or in reality and not in reality. The mind begins to um, deal in or live or wander in delusion, or illusion. The past, which is gone. The future, which hasn't, which hasn't come and isn't sure. Um, ideas about yourself, like... Um, worried about things that you've done or, or things you have to do, um, interested in, in our image, our self-image and so on, uh, you know, how do I look, how do I, how do I sound and so on. The mind has this tendency to not be here. So morality, if you want to understand from an ultimate point of view, it's this beginning it's the pulling of the mind back. In the beginning, it's when again and again we bring our mind back to the present moment, reminding ourselves, yes, here I am. And here there is seeing, there is hearing, there is smelling, and back to what is real again. I'm sitting. So when you just begin by saying to yourself, sitting, or watching your, your breath, or the stomach rise and fall, or the breath go in and out, this is morality. This is the basis of meditation practice. This is how we start to meditate. It takes mindfulness, you see? It takes this recognition that you're wandering. When you're distracted, the recognition, the practice is to recognize that you're wandering, or that you're distracted, and bring yourself back. This is correct because this is the only thing that will lead to concentration. Morality is said to lead to concentration, so clearly this is what we mean by morality, because this is the only way you're going to start to concentrate, is if you bring your mind back to the object in this case, back to reality. Concentration means focusing on an object. If you focus on this leaf, you're concentrated on the leaf. In Buddhism, the core of Buddhism, concentration means focusing not on the leaf, not on the angel, not on love and beings and so on. Concentrating on reality. Why? Because concentration on reality is the only thing that can give rise to wisdom. If you focus on the leaf, you don't learn about reality. If you love people, if I focus on Jacob and how much I love him, and for doing this filming for me, that's great, but it's not going to teach me about reality. It's no longer reality. Jacob doesn't exist, I don't exist, there's only seeing, or hearing, or smelling, or tasting, or feeling, or thinking. The experience is lost. I'm no longer um, living in reality. I'm living in concepts. Jacob arises up here, I think of him. It's a concept in my mind. Reality is my experience. I see him. I see with light. You know, there's light touching the eye. So, true, and true concentration in a Buddhist sense is concentration on reality. When you focus on things arising and ceasing, you focus on things coming and going, changing. You focus on your emotions, you focus on your feelings, you focus on your physical and mental states, your thoughts, your uh, the movements of the body. You can focus on anything, just let it be reality. This is concentration. Why? Because it leads to wisdom. You start to understand all that I was talking about in the beginning. You understand what is causing you suffering, what is bringing you happiness. What are you doing to yourself right here and now? And your question is, what am I doing to you, making you listen to this talk for so long? My legs are falling asleep, my back hurts, so it's getting late, i got to go home, i got things to do, i got to get up in the morning for work. What is this guy doing to me? Well, I challenge you, what are you doing to yourself? Because I'm not going to stop talking just because you don't like it. <laughs> I might, I might cut it short. No, I can't, I just keep talking until it's finished. I don't know when it's finished any more than you do. Um, but this is just an example. Sure, I can stop talking and let you all go home, but you, you can't live your life like that. 
yes, maybe now it's, I have to be reasonable and give you the time to do your things, but when you get cancer, you know, how many people in this room are going to die of cancer? That'd be an interesting thing to see in 20, 30 years, right? Um, you know, what, what sort of suffering might come to us? And you don't have to get cancer. Our life is full of these challenges. Um, you know, just an example, you can just be sitting here listening to a Dhamma talk and have these challenges. You can have them in anything you do. You can be eating ice cream and have these challenges. If you swallow it too fast, you get a brain freeze, right? You can be doing something you love and, and have these challenges. Have, have uh, issues. You know, you're, you're watching a movie and someone comes in and starts yammering away and you get angry at them. We cause ourselves suffering. No one else does. So we have a responsibility to free ourselves from suffering. This is what the Buddha meant by wisdom. That our own understanding, our own misunderstanding is causing us suffering. It's, it's us that are our own problem. You can't blame anyone else for your problems. This is highly uh, empowering. You, know? you don't have to... Um, sit around and wait for chance or you don't have to resign yourself to fate you really do have the power to free yourself whoever you are, whoever we are in whatever situation we are you need the right teaching you need uh, time you need the right qualities of mind it's, for some people it's going to take longer than others but um Intrinsically, there's nothing wrong with us. You know, intrinsically, even people in the Buddha's time, there's examples. He's, this man, he killed his father. He was this prince, killed his father to become king. If you kill your father or your mother, you can't become enlightened. Even he, in the future, the Buddha predicted that he will become a uh, Pacheka Buddha, I think. I can't remember what they predicted about him. Devadatta, the Buddha predicted he will become a Pacheka Buddha. Meaning, but all I mean by that is that, yeah, maybe in this life we don't become enlightened, but we have the power. We, all it takes is your own understanding. All that's keeping us from freedom is our own uh, inability to understand ourselves. So as you cultivate mindfulness, your mind comes back and stays in the present moment. As it stays there, you focus more and more of your energy on the present moment, less and less on distractions. The bad habits start to fade away and the good habits start to arise. Understanding starts to bloom. You start to see connections. You realize what you're doing to yourself and you let it go. When you let it go, you're free. When you're free, you say, I'm free. This is how the Buddha put, put it. <laughs> Buddha was a master at these things. That's why we bow to him. I just I don't have anything. I'm just taking it from him. When you're free, you say you're free. Usitang brahmacharyang, lived is the holy life. Katang karaniyang, done is what must be done, what should be done. Natidani, natidani punabhavo, there is nothing, oh, I'm not getting it right. There's nothing more to be done here, basically. That's it. That's all there is. You see? You don't have to believe anything in Buddhism. There's no views, there's no... The dharma of the Buddha is just reality. It's just here and now. I think that, what I've just said, really sums up Buddhism for me. So uh, that was the Dhamma I wanted to give, and I think I've completed it. Now I can stop. Thank you all for patiently listening, and I hope it was of some use. And it better have been, because now we're going to try to put it to use and practice together for a half an hour. If anyone has to leave because I talk too long, please feel free to leave. But otherwise... Sit with us for a while and then we'll let you leave. And we'll have questions after that if anyone has. Thank you. <laughs>